This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 132. Martian dust storms seem to generate Earth-like clouds. A solar storm smashes a crack in Earth's magnetosphere. And Europe's new Ariane 6 launcher delayed until next year. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft has revealed that the red planet churns up surprisingly Earth-like cloud patterns that are reminiscent of those seen in our planet's tropical regions. What makes this interesting is that Earth and Mars have vastly different atmospheres. The cold, dry atmosphere of Mars is composed almost entirely of carbon dioxide, while Earth's is rich in nitrogen and oxygen. And the atmospheric density of the red planet is also very different, less than 1 50th that of Earth's atmosphere, equivalent to the density found at about 35 kilometres above Earth's surface. Yet despite being so widely different, Martian cloud patterns have been found to be surprisingly Earth-like, and that's pointing to very similar formation processes. Now, a new study reported in the journal Icarus dives deeper into two dust storms that occurred near the Martian North Pole back in 2019. Both storms were monitored during springtime at the Martian North Pole, a time when local storms commonly brew around the receding ice cap. Two cameras aboard Mars Express, the visual monitoring camera and the high-resolution stereo camera, together with a camera aboard NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, imaged the storms from orbit. The sequence of visual monitoring camera images showed that the storms appear to grow and disappear in repeated cycles over a period of days, exhibiting common features and shapes. Spiral shapes are notably visible in the wider views in the high-resolution stereo camera images. The spirals are between 1 and 2,000 kilometers in length, and their origins are the same as that of extratropical cyclones observed in Earth's mid-latitudes and polar latitudes. But the images also reveal a specific phenomenon only found on Mars. They show that the Martian dust storms are made up of regularly spaced smaller cloud cells arranged like grains or pebbles. Now, this texture is also seen in clouds in Earth's atmosphere. Here, the familiar textures are formed by convection, where hot air rises because it's less dense than the cooler air around it. The type of convection observed here is closed cell convection, when air rises at the centre of a small cloud pocket or cell. And the gaps in the sky around the cloud cells are the pathways for cooler air to sink below the hot rising air. On Earth, the rising air contains water which condenses to form clouds. The dust clouds imaged by Mars Express are showing the same process, but on Mars the rising air columns contain dust rather than water. The sun heats the dust-laden air, causing it to rise and form dusty cells. The cells are then surrounded by areas of sinking air which is less dust, and this gives rise to the granular patterns also seen in images of clouds on Earth. By tracking the movement of cells in a sequence of images, the wind speeds on Mars are also measured. It seems the winds blow over the Martian cloud features at speeds of up to 140 kilometers an hour, causing the shape of the cells to elongate in the direction of the wind. So, despite the chaotic and dynamic atmospheres of Mars and Earth, nature still manages to create these orderly patterns. This is Mars Express project scientist Colin Wilson says that when thinking of a Mars-like atmosphere on Earth, one might easily think of a dry desert or polar region. Wilson says it's quite unexpected, then, that by tracking the chaotic movements of dust storms, that parallels can be drawn with the processes that occur in Earth's moist, hot and decidedly very un-Mars-like tropical regions. One key insight made possible with the visual monitoring camera images is the measurement of the altitude of the dust clouds. The length of the shadows they cast can be measured and then combined with knowledge of the sun's position in order to measure the height of the cloud above the Martian surface. The results reveal that dust can reach approximately 6 to 11 kilometers above the ground, and the cells typically have horizontal sizes of between 20 and 40 kilometers. Despite the unpredictable behavior of dust storms on Mars and the strong wind gusts that accompany them, scientists have seen that within their complexity, organized structures, such as frosts and cellular convection patterns, can still emerge. Such organized cellular convection is not unique to Earth and Mars. Observations of the Venusian atmosphere by Venus Express has shown similar patterns. 
as well as understanding more about how planetary atmospheres work, understanding dust storms is relevant for future missions to Mars. That's because in extreme cases, dust storms can block out much of the light from the sun from reaching the solar cells on rovers on the surface of the red planet. You may recall back in 2018, a planetary scale dust storm not only blocked sunlight reaching the surface, but it also covered the solar panels of NASA's Mars Opportunity rover with dust. These two factors led to the rover losing electrical power and being forced to end its mission. It's the reason why the Mars Curiosity and Perseverance rovers are both nuclear powered. Monitoring the evolution of dust storms, therefore, is crucial to helping protect future solar-powered missions and eventually manned missions to the Red Planet against such powerful phenomena. This is Space Time. Still to come, a solar storm smashes a crack in Earth's magnetosphere, and SpaceX's Dragon arrives at the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. It's been revealed that solar storms which smashed into the Earth last month cracked a hole in the planet's magnetosphere, triggering rare pink aurora. The extremely rare space weather events filled the Norwegian skies with an explosion of neon pink auroral activity. Aurora occur when high-energy charged particles, usually protons and electrons, generated during geomagnetic storms on the Sun, collide with the Earth's magnetosphere and are guided by the planet's magnetic field lines through the ionosphere, a region of charged particles. As these particles travel towards the north and south magnetic poles, they collide with oxygen and nitrogen atoms and molecules in the Earth's upper atmosphere. That causes them to excite and emit photons, giving off a glow and producing those colourful curtain-like displays known as the northern and southern lights, the aurora borealis and aurora australis. Now, the colours emitted depends on which particles are being ionised. Reddish-brown glows are caused by the collision of particles with a single oxygen atom in Earth's upper atmosphere that's above 300 kilometres. Lower down, the commonly seen green hues are created by a single oxygen atom down to altitudes of about 100 kilometres. The kaleidoscope turns a whitish-yellow beige when nitrogen is mixed in with the oxygen. An aurora will exhibit a pink, blue, red or even purple glow in the lower atmosphere, which is caused by the excitation of molecular nitrogen below 100 kilometres. That's what we've seen this time. Amazingly, the geomagnetic storm which triggered this sky show was caused by a relatively minor G1-class solar storm which slammed into the Earth on November the 3rd. Witnesses say the event lasted about six hours and also generated strong green aurorae during the evening. This is Space Time. Still to come, SpaceX's 26th Commercial Dragon resupply mission arrives at the International Space Station the maiden flight of Europe's new Ariane 6 heavy launcher delayed until next year. And later in the science report, a new study has found that witchcraft and wicker are still widespread around the world. All that and more still to come on Space Time. SpaceX's 26th Commercial Dragon resupply mission for NASA has successfully docked to the International Space Station two days after launching from Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The CRS-26 mission had been delayed by four days due to bad weather at the Cape. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in countdown. All right, so both stages are now pressurizing for launch. We will next hear at T-45 seconds, the SpaceX launch director, Mike Taylor, verifying go for launch. Go for launch. All right, range remains go for launch. Weather is a go. Today will be the first flight of both the booster and Dragon spacecraft. T-30 seconds. At launch, the International Space Station will be 260 miles in altitude, flying south of Nuremberg, Germany. Stage 1, pressing for flight. 15 seconds. All right, here we go. Go. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, engine full power, 
and liftoff of CRS-26, go Falcon, and happy Thanksgiving, ISS. That's right, liftoff of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket for the 26th cargo resupply mission, bringing new science experiments and solar arrays to the International Space Station. carrying CRS-26 on its way to the International Space Station. We are throttling down the engines on the first stage, and this helps us prepare for Max-Q, which is maximum dynamic pressure. It's the largest structural load that the vehicle sees on ascent. Max-Q. There's that call out that we passed through Max-Q. We are coming up on a few events happening back to back. That's going to be MECO or main engine cutoff as the first event. That's where all nine of the M1D engines shut down on that first stage. And that's in preparation for the next event, which is stage separation. That's where the first and second stage separate. The first stage will flip around and make its way back down to earth and land on our drone ship named Just Read the Instructions, while the second stage ignites its Merlin MVAC engine to boost Dragon to low Earth orbit during SES-1, or second stage engine start one. And the last event is the boost back burn to reduce, two, the velocity of, to reduce the velocity of the first stage in preparation for atmospheric re-entry. And that whole sequence takes about 30 seconds, and we are coming up on those few events. And Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Stage, stage one, boost back startup. Stage two, ignition. We had Miko, stage separation, the MVAC engine lighting up the first stage there, falling back to Earth, doing a flip, and now in its boost back burn. That burn lasts about 30 seconds long. Stage one, boost back, shut down. And there's that call out, and the boost back burn has shut down on the first stage. The grid fins are deploying on that first stage. This is SpaceX's 54th mission for 2022 and the fifth Dragon flight to the International Space Station just this year. Now, we lifted off just about four minutes ago from Kennedy Space Center at Launch Complex 39A. And so far, both vehicles on nominal trajectories for the first stage in order to make its way back to our drone ship. Again, just read the instructions. It has a couple more burns to execute. The first is the entry burn. That's where three of the Merlin engines reignite. This entry burn helps to slow the vehicle down as it re-enters the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, the second burn is the final burn for the first stage. It is called the landing burn, and this is a single engine burn that brings the vehicle's speed down rapidly in order to touch down on the drone ship. Some bursts of gas, that is nitrogen gas burst for attitude control. Four grid fins on the first stage. These are hypersonic grid fins positioned near the top of the first stage. So once it's in the atmosphere, stage one only uses the grid fins to steer as it makes its way back down to Earth. Now they orient the rocket. Safe. They orient the rocket during re-entry and guide the rocket. Stage one entry during burn descent. startup. Entry burn has begun stage on the first stage. Shut down. And there you can see those engines shut down. That concludes the entry burn for the first stage. Again, next up will be the landing burn for that first stage vehicle. Stage two is still looking good. Burn stage beginning one, on the first stage. Again, this is a single engine, the center E9 engine burn to help slow the vehicle down. Just enough to touch down on the drone ship. Stage one landing just burn. Just read the instructions today. The landing burn has begun on the first stage. Falcon 9 touches down on just read the instructions. Landing like deploy. Really awesome stage views one there. Confirmed. Falcon 9 has touched down. It's standing tall on just read the, read the instructions there on your screen. Now, while this Falcon 9 just completed its first flight, it marks the 153rd successful Back landing down. for an orbital class rocket. Now, next up, we do have Seco 1 on the second stage. That's where the Merlin vacuum H2 engine will head. shut down. And Seco 1, or second stage engine H2 cutoff FTS 1. Is saved. Seco. And there we heard the call out for Seco. That MVAC engine Nominal shut down. Portion. And great call out there. That means we have confirmation of a good orbit for the second stage still carrying the Dragon vehicle. Now we are T plus nine minutes into the mission. Coming up on the last major task for stage two, commanding separation of Dragon a couple minutes from now. CRS-26 will be joining the Crew-5 vehicle currently on orbit, so we'll be back to having two Dragon spacecraft docked at the space station. As for cargo today, we will be delivering more than 7,700 pounds of science, research, crew supplies, and vehicle hardware to the orbital laboratory and its crew. And to date, SpaceX has sent and brought back over 250,000 pounds of crew and cargo to and from the International Space Station. Some fun facts about Dragon. Dragon has 16 Draco engines, which have about 90 
pounds of thrust each. But there are no Super Dracos on this vehicle, no seats, no life support systems, and that saves weight and space for faster refurbishment um, time because this is a Dragon cargo vehicle versus a crew vehicle. Dragon also has big solar arrays on the trunk. The dark side is covered in solar arrays, and the light side is a radiator to cool the spacecraft. The Dragon can autonomously dock using its navigation sensors and centerline camera. We are just a few seconds away from Dragon separation from Falcon 9's second stage. Dragon separation confirmed. Dragon separation. And hearing those callouts as Dragon is drifting away from Falcon 9's second stage. The spacecraft's three and a half tons of supplies, scientific equipment, and space station hardware included a second pair of International Space Station rollout solar arrays, or IROSES. They'll complement the two set up last year as part of an overall plan to increase the orbiting outpost power supply by between 20 and 30 percent. A third set of IROSES are yet to be flown up. Also in the CRS-26 manifest are moon microscope test kits for in-flight medical diagnoses. These include a portable handheld microscope and a small self-contained blood sampling staining device to provide diagnostic capabilities for the crew. To improve access to fresh food while in orbit, a new plant growth test unit called VEG-05 has been flown up. Following the success of earlier units growing green leafy vegetables, the new unit will focus on growing dwarf tomatoes. Also aboard is an extrusion experiment, which will use photocurable liquid resin to create structural shapes and forms that simply can't be produced on Earth because of the deformation caused by gravity. The Bionutrients 2 experiment tests a system using yogurt, a fermented milk product known as kefir, and a yeast-based beverage to produce key nutrients to supplement crew's supplies of vitamins, nutrients, and pharmaceuticals that have limited shelf lives. Then there's the Falcon Goggles hardware experiment. It'll capture high-speed video of a subject's eyes, providing precise data on ocular alignment and balance, which will be important for future space missions in which astronauts may encounter three different gravity fields, the weightlessness of space, the gravity on another planet, and of course Earth's gravity when they return. The thing is, these transitions can affect spatial orientation, head-eye and hand-eye coordination, balance and locomotion, and they cause some crew members to also experience space motion sickness. The Dragon's also carrying eight CubeSats. These are loaded with a range of scientific experiments, different high schools, universities and space agencies. The Dragon cargo ship will remain docked to the Harmony Module Zenith port for about 45 days before returning to Earth loaded with completed experiments as well as return supplies and equipment aiming for a splashdown off the coast of Florida. And just five days before the Dragon flight, SpaceX launched the Utilsat 10B telecommunications satellite into geostationary transfer orbit aboard another Falcon 9 rocket, this time flying from Space Launch Complex 40 at the adjoining Cape Canaveral Space Force Base. A previous attempt to launch the satellite had been scrubbed a day earlier due to bad weather. The six-ton Thales Alenia Space Belt satellite will provide broadband communications covering an area from the North Atlantic across to Asia, including vast areas of Europe, the Middle East and Africa. SpaceX used an expendable version of the Falcon 9 for this mission. Sending the Utilsat 10B to a high-energy supersynchronous transfer orbit, which will shorten the time it takes for the all-electric satellite to reach its final geostationary orbit using just its own thrusters. Of course, all the attention at the moment is on the two big American mega-rockets, NASA's Space Launch System, or SLS, which has just flown the Artemis One mission's Orion spacecraft to the moon, and SpaceX's soon-to-fly Starship Super Heavy, an even bigger rocket than the SLS, which is now being developed in Texas and could launch on its maiden flight later this month. But there are other players building big new launch vehicles. The United Launch Alliance is still developing their new Vulcan Centaur rocket. It was supposed to fly this year as well, but has now been delayed till at least next. It'll eventually replace both the Atlas V and Delta IV launch vehicles. And the European Space Agency are also developing their own new launch vehicle. It's called the Ariane 6, and it will replace the current Ariane 5. Like the Vulcan Centaur, the Ariane 6 was developed to halve launch costs compared to the Ariane 5 and also increase the number of launches per year from the current 6 or 7 up to as many as 11 flights annually. 
Ariane Space now expects the first launch for the Ariane 6 to take place sometime during the fourth quarter of next year. ESA's Director of Space Transportation, Daniel Neuenschwender, says the latest delay was caused by several factors, including the introduction of a new power unit and delays in testing and developing of the robotic arms, which assist on the launch pad during rocket fueling. Meanwhile, Ariane Space Chief Executive Stefani Israel says more than 29 launches have already been booked for the Ariane 6. Ariane 6 is designed around two core stages, both powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. The first stage uses an improved version of the Vulcan engine already used on the Ariane 5. Known as the Vulcan 2.1, it'll help propel Ariane 6 for the first 10 minutes of flight, up to an altitude of around 200 kilometers, delivering 135 tons of thrust in a vacuum. It has a simplified but more robust nozzle, a 3D printed gas generator, and a heater for oxygen tank pressurization. The engine's first test campaign began in January this year, with the first test firing being at the German space agency DLR's test facilities, La Bolschausen. A total of 12 successful engine tests were undertaken during the initial campaign, culminating in over 105 minutes of burn time. A second test campaign began in October. While the lower stage uses a revamped version of the highly successful existing engine, the Ariane 6 upper stage will use a totally new designed reignitable engine called the Vinci. This will increase operational flexibility for the Ariane 6, allowing more precise orbital insertion and also ensuring that the upper stage can deorbit safely at the end of its mission. The Vinci was also tested at La Bolschausen, being ignited over 140 times, including multiple reignites in succession in near vacuum conditions in order to complete its qualification. Final testing in October brought the Vinci's total burn time to more than 14 hours of operation. However, most of the initial liftoff thrust for the Ariane 6 won't be provided by the liquid-fueled engine, but by either two or four strap-on solid rocket boosters attached to the first stage. The Ariane 6-2 version will feature two P120 strap-on boosters, or the Ariane 6-4 variant will use four of them. The P120 is now flight-proven. It underwent hot firing in French Guiana in July 2018, with the SIB burning 142 tonnes of propellant in 135 seconds. The P-120 also forms the core stage of the smaller Vega C rocket, which undertook its maiden flight into space successfully in July. During October, the Ariane 6 was fully integrated into its new launch complex at the Carreau spaceport in French Guiana for the first time. The new launch facility was built by the French space agency CANES and includes a vehicle assembly building, fueling and ancillary facilities, a 700-ton launch table and an 8,200-ton mobile gantry that will store and protect the Ariane 6 until it's retracted five hours before each launch. With the Ariane 6 now fully integrated into the launch pad, combined tests are validating the rocket, the launch pad and the shared electrical, fluid and mechanical systems seeing how they operate as a single complete unit. These combined tests include tank filling and drainage operations, which guarantee smooth running of the launch sequence. Flight and control software are also being tested. It's kept off a busy year for the Ariane 6's development. Currently, there are more than 600 companies across 13 European nations which are manufacturing components for the new rocket. This report from ESA TV. In the forest of Lampoldshausen near Stuttgart, lies the German Aerospace Agency's Institute of Space Propulsion. Over the last 40 years, nearly all the liquid propulsion engines of every version of the Ariane launch vehicle have been tested here. And ESA's new Ariane 6 is no exception. With its maiden flight in sight, many of its components are being checked here. To accommodate this new vehicle, several of the test facilities have been modified. We have the P5, uh, which is testing currently the main stage engine, the Vulcan 2.1 for the Ariane 6. It looks like a launch pad, complete with different floors in a tower, similar to the ones at Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. Operations inside this facility are monitored from a central control room. After final preparations, a countdown marks the start of the test, just like an actual rocket launch. The Ariane 6 upper stage incorporates the Vinci reignitable rocket engine. This reignition is a key feature, adding versatility to Ariane 6 missions. While this engine has already been hot fire tested, 
it's essential to also understand the overall behavior of the whole upper stage before Ariane 6 is made in flight. In the development of a launch system, of a launch system, you want to test the stages in the most clo- in the closest condition to the flight one. So we want to have a real stage test and not uh, just m- a giant test, which is performed in a, another test bench close by here. At the Ariane 6 upper stage test stand, all aspects of the flight are simulated, such as the preparation of the stage and also the flight itself. It's important to know how the upper stage behaves when the Vinci engine is running. The upcoming launch of Ariane 6 generates a lot of activity here in Lampolshausen, but also in factories and research centers all over Europe, and of course in Kourou, where a massive launch pad is being built. For the development of Ariane 6, the approach is new. Design and manufacturing are done almost in parallel, an important task for ESA and European industry. The difficulty of Ariane 6, the challenge of Ariane 6 is also given by the schedule uh, and we know that uh, we had uh, uh, a little bit more than five years to build the old launch system and to qualify the old launch system and this is uh, the, a, a real uh, interesting uh, kind of challenge that we have because we have to coordinate, synchronize many developments at the same time. Despite this tight schedule, the many parallel builds and developments, ESA and industry accepted the challenge to develop this launch system in only five years. From Kourou to Lampoldshausen, the development of Ariane 6 continues at full speed in order to offer a competitive launch vehicle for the commercial market, while at the same time securing Europe's independent access to space. And in that report from ECTV, we heard from DLR's Head of Test Facilities, Anya Frank, and ESA's Ariane 6 Launch System Architect Manager, Pier Domenico Resta. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.